Uh, so, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are, ladies and gentlemen. And welcome to the second webinar organized by Arafura and Timor Sea's Ecosystem Action, or at C2, and Oil Spill Response Limited, or OSRL. At C2 and uh, OSR, OSRL has collaborated this year uh, to deliver quarterly webinars. Uh, I am Norman Ramos from OSRL. I will be your facilitator for this webinar. Our hope is to share learning and have a productive discussions through this webinar. Before we start, uh, we would just like to run through uh, our ground rules for this webinar. Uh, so first and foremost, be respectful for, uh, at all times. Uh, avoid using all capital letters in your chat boxes. Uh, anybody can actually uh, chat to each other. Keep your microphones in at mute and videos off. If you have questions, please type your messages in the chat box and we will attend to your messages. Uh, your questions will be answered during the plen plenary uh, towards the end of this webinar. And as I have mentioned earlier, this webinar will be recorded and the recording will be made available. We will also request you to complete the attendance and feedback form, and this will be shared uh, during the webinar. And please also take note that our webinar is streamed live um, in at C2 YouTube channel. So quick run through of the different functionalities of Zoom, and, I, and I'm sure most of you are aware of this already. So you would see your unmute and mute button. So please keep yourself uh, on mute at all times. You can also see your uh, start and stop your video, uh, but we do highly recommend that you keep your video off to maintain internet reliability. Uh, what's important here is the chat box. So please type your questions or any messages uh, in the chat icon. Uh, you wouldn't be using the share screen, but of course, if you want to react, there are uh, the, there's the button for your reactions. Right, so the speakers for uh, this uh, for today's webinar, so we have the honor and pleasure to have the following resource speakers today. So we have Ms. Cassandra Tanya, uh, Ms. Cassie. Uh, she's the regional biodiversity expert from at C2. And actually, it's an honor and pleasure working alongside Ms. Cassie on the delivery of this webinar. So OSR has been working uh, with Ms. Cassie with regards to these webinars. We will also be joined by our experts from OSRL, Ms. Hon Kui Han, OSRL's Aviation Liaison Officer, and Mr. Nobel Ong, uh, a spill response specialist from OSRL. So Kui Han has been working in OSRL for about eight years, and she has attended to a number of oil spills uh, in Singapore and abroad. Uh, she will be talking about surveillance modeling and visualization as a response strategy. While Nobel, uh, he's about four years in Oil Spill Response Limited already. Uh, he will talk about uh, oil spill response strategies. He has been, uh, he has attended a number of uh, spills as well. Uh, most notably is the recent spill, uh, which was last year, uh, with regards to uh, a ship issue in, in Sri Lanka. And uh, we will be hearing Nobel talk about this as well in his presentation. So to start off this uh, webinar, I will pass it on to Ms. Cassie to provide us an overview of the at sea 2 uh, The floor is yours, Ms. Cassie. Right. Thank you, Norman. Uh, I'm, I'm going to try to share my screen first, uh, if I may. OK. I hope everyone can can see my screen. Uh, so yes, I see thumbs up. Thank you. Um, so again, my name is Cassandra Tania, but yeah, most of my friends, colleagues uh, call me Cassie. I'm the regional biodiversity specialist of at C2, and it is my pleasure today to welcome you all in our second webinar, second quarterly webinar. So I will talk briefly and give an introduction of uh, our project. So. Uh, the ATC2 is the second phase of Arafura and Timor Sea's uh, ecosystem action program, and it is uh, GF financed and UNDP supported. Uh, it builds upon uh, 
conditional results that realized in the first phase uh, between 2009 and 2014. So as a project, we work in this uh, dark blue region. Uh, it, we usually call it as the, the APS region, the Arab Marine Timor Seas region. It is part of the North Australian Shelf uh, Large Marine Ecosystem. And it is bordered by four countries, uh, Indonesia, Timor-Leste, uh, Papua New Guinea, and also Australia. Our project beneficiaries are three countries, Indonesia, Timor-Leste, and Papua New Guinea, while uh, Australia provides support. Um, and then in Indonesia, we work in three sites, in Aru Islands, in Merauke, and also in Rotendau. While in Papua New Guinea, we only work in one site, in South Fly. Uh, which, which is part of the Western province. And in Timor-Leste, basically we work on the Southern coast. So uh, we work in five municipalities uh, from Kopalima, Manufahi, Manutipu, PKK, to Lauten. And then uh, as a project, uh, our focus, uh, we focus on the five priority environmental uh, transboundary issues. So first is the over-exploitation of marine resources. Second is the loss or degradation of habitats. And third is uh, the loss or degradations of uh, biodiversity. Fourth is plant and marine-based pollution. And the last one is climate change. And of course, today's webinar will be linked uh, to this uh, environmental uh, concern, the land and marine-based pollution. Then again, as a project, uh, we have three major outcomes. Well, not outcome components. Uh, so the first component on uh, governance, uh, second is on improving a large marine ecosystem carrying capacity, and third is on uh, knowledge management. We have uh, nine outcomes. Uh, these are the outcomes, and we have 23 target outputs. So in relation to uh, marine and land-based pollution, uh, we have one specific one, one specific outcome, the outcome 2.2 on reduced marine pollution. So basically, uh, with this outcome, we try to enhance data information uh, regarding the marine land-based pollution. We try to identify the pollution hotspot, uh, try to control uh, point and non-point sources of pollution, and also to strengthen all spill early warning systems and also capacities. And then uh, since the, yeah, the last of 2020 till uh, the mid of 2021, we have been working with uh, Dr. Wang Tai Xin uh, to conduct a regional marine and land-based pollution assessment. Uh, here is the report. So if you'd like to read the report, uh, you can just uh, scan uh, this QR code. And the assessment basically identified uh, two regional uh, wide concerns uh, in regards to pollution for the APS region, uh, which are oil spill and marine litter. And then for marine litter, uh, we actually identified that the southern coast of Timor and also Rote Islands are the most vulnerable uh, sites in regards to oil spill incidents. And then uh, after identifying, uh, yeah, the, the oil spill hotspot. We basically, since the beginning of 2022, worked together with OSRL, as explained by Norman earlier, to, yeah, in a, uh, to hold uh, four quarterly webinars. So basically, uh, we will organize one webinar each quarter uh, in this uh, year. And then the webinar is basically uh, to enable information sharing amongst and also build capacity of the APS stakeholders on oil spill preparedness and response. And then uh, to do so, basically we design uh, the webinar topics to be progressive. So the first webinar, uh, basically uh, we try to make our stakeholders more aware of the, the oil spill impacts. And then from there, well, we both move to, uh, yeah, to more understanding of oil spill risks and finally to what it takes to respond to oil spill incidents effectively. And yeah, we also, to do so, we also like introduce key, key principles uh, that, that are involved in preparing for and responding to oil spill incidents. So as I said, uh, and also as Norman said, that this is the second webinar. Uh, we have the, the first webinar on 24th of February. 
uh, three, three months ago. And then the first webinar was attended by 76 participants from eight countries. Uh, of course, from four APS countries, but we also have other participants from Malaysia, Nigeria, Philippines, and also Uruguay. And basically, uh, in the first webinar, uh, the speakers talk about the yeah, causes and fates of marine oil spills, how oil properties would actually correlate with the appropriate response strategies. And then uh, there's also a yeah, presentation about the impact of marine oil spills. So basically, we try uh, to recognize the marine oil spill have environmental and socioeconomic impact, especially uh, for the APS regions. And then uh, as part of the presentation, uh, the speaker also reminded us uh, it is important uh, to have an inventory of environmental and socioeconomic resources. And of course, uh, lastly, uh, we try to exercise a holistic decision making that based on resources that can be impacted by oil spills. And then for this, uh, today's webinar, uh, our two great speakers will talk about surveillance modeling and visualization, and then also oil spill response strategies. I won't go uh, into details because I, I think it will spoil the fun. Uh, and then, yeah, that's, uh, that's about it. Uh, thank you, everyone. And back to you, Norman. Uh, thank you, Ms. Tassi. So uh, thank you for the... Uh, preview of the webinar and of course the introduction to the um, introduction to the C2. Right, so uh, quickly I would like to talk about Oil Spill Response uh, Limited. So about OSRL, so we are the leading uh, global oil spill response specialist since 1985. So we are the largest internationally funded cooperative. So basically, we are wholly owned uh, by the most environmentally responsible oil, gas, and energy companies who actually represent the majority of the global oil production. So through OSRL, our members uh, would gain access to OSRL's full suite of expertise for the response and preparedness needs on a global basis. So again, we are the largest international industry-funded cooperative. Uh, we are owned by major oil and gas production and transportation companies. And we provide resources to prepare and respond to oil spills efficiently and effectively uh, across the globe. Uh, please take note that the resources is not only equipment, but also refers to the expertise. So that would be uh, a quick introduction of OSRL. And to all our participants, you can proceed to type your questions as early as now or, or during the presentations. So please do not worry if your questions are not read or not answered today. So after the webinar, uh, what we're going to do is OSRL will release an online article uh, to answer all the questions that you have in this webinar. So even if we don't answer it today, don't worry. If we will still answer that, and then we will publish an online article. Right. So without further delay, uh, our first presenter for today is Pui Hang. So as I have mentioned earlier, Pui Hang will be, she will be talking about surveillance, modeling, and visualization. So Pui Hang, the floor is yours. Thank you, Norman. Um, just, hi, everyone. My name is Pui Hang, so just let me share the screen. Do give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen. Wonderful. Thank you for having me to share on the surveillance uh, modeling and visualizations. So I think without further ado, I just proceed with the presentations. So what we would like to talk about today. So I think there are three main takeaways I hope you can gain from these sessions. So I think first, uh, I would like to touch on the, you'll get an understanding on why we need to conduct surveillance uh, in an event of oil spill incidents and what are the surveillance tools that you may use in the response. So next, you'll be learning about two different types of oil spill modeling and what are their differences. So lastly, you will be giving to know what does the visualizations refer to and how common operating features helps us in decisions making in a response. 
So before we dive into details, so let's do a warm up exercise to set you to the scene of an oil spill incident. So with the help of Rachel, uh, in a short while, you will see a poll that will pop up in your screen. And what I need you to do is just to click yes or no to the picture that you have seen. So there's a total of three pictures and you just need to make a guess if the slick is oil or not. So when you are ready, so you will see the pop-up already on the picture one. So maybe just make a guess, uh, is it a yes or no? For whether it's an oil or not. So I see the polling results keep coming in. Just we have 48 participants and just give a, maybe another countdown to 10 seconds. down to another three seconds. There are still votes coming in. All right. Okay, I think Rachel, you may end the poll. Okay, I have 75% uh, people participate. It's around 36 out of 48. So I encourage more to, to click the yes or no and just make a guess. There's a, yeah, definitely there's a right or wrong answer, but no worries. I think just to let you to have a feel on what you will see at the oil spill incidents or at the site. So I think all have wonderful answers. I think mean, 100% give me yes for those who are participate. So I shall not keep you in suspense. So the answer is yes, it's actually a, rainbow chains. So you will just take a note on, I use the word rainbow, which I will explain it further in the presentations later. So are you ready for the second features? So Rachel, please go for the second one. Oh, this is interesting. I have yes and no answers. So later you will know whether you get it right or wrong. So keep the votes coming in. Oh, we have, we have quite 50-50 now. There are more no than yes. Do we want to keep the vote going on? Any more supporters for the yes? It's not much of a difference. I'll give another maybe 10 seconds before we close this poll. There are still more no than yes. Holding down to another three seconds. Make your final vote if you think that is a yes or a no. All right, the poll has ended, and I think we can see that there's actually 19 of you who think that is a yes, and 25 of you think a no. So the answer is. No, <laughs> it's actually a red tide. So if you wonder what is a red tide, a red tide is a phenomenon of discolorations of sea surface. So it is a common name for harmful algae blooms occurring along coastal regions, which results from large concentrations of aquatic microorganisms. So this is not an oil. So moving on to the last picture. So Rachel, you can put out. Oh. So these look similar. So do give your best 
guess if it is a yes or no. It may be a trick question. It may be two no in a row. Or this can be an odd. Many of you have confidence that it's a yes. You have some no. The, oh, this is quite fast. Many people have voted. There's still a small percentage. So I do encourage those who want to cast your vote to do it in another 10 seconds. Another counting down to three seconds. All right, we shall end this poll. Okay, the results here is most of you actually voted for yes and a small percentage going for no. So the final picture, the final answer, yes, it's actually an emulsified heavy oil. So if you wonder why it's actually emulsified oil, it's actually all oil undergo a weathering process when it exposes to the environment. So emulsified oil refers to oil that takes up uh, water and form water in oil emulsions. So it behaves similarly like a viscous oil. So looking at these pictures, so many will be many questions will pop up in your mind. And I think some questions will be like, um, what got spilled? Is it oil or not? Just like the pictures I've gone through. So if it's a yes, how much was it spilled? Or where does it go? When does it get there? And lastly, I mean, who does it impact? Or what is impacted? And what should be done about it? So ultimately, I mean, as a responsible, I mean, responding party, you will need to minimize the impact that in an event, oil has been spilled into the environment. So that is the very primary goal that you want to minimize the impact when the damage is done. So I think this gives us a good context on what I want to cover for today, to what is surveillance, um, modeling, and visualizations. So this tiered preparedness and response will may look familiar to you. So it is recognized as the basis on which to establish a robust oil spill preparedness and response framework. So the established three tiered structures allow those involved in contingency planning to describe how an effective response uh, to any oil spill will be provided. So from small operational spillage to a worst case release at sea or on land. So the structures provide a mechanism uh, to identify how individual elements of capability will be cascaded. So the SMV is actually one of them. So which helps to collect and evaluate the current uh, information as well as to forecast for the response so that the incident management team can make informed decisions for the response. So often, it is the most important response strategies at the onset of an incident. So what is SMP? So I think definitions for the first one, surveillance. So it refers to close observations. So in this context, surveillance uh, uses sensors from the space to the seabed to observe oil behaviors. So we'll discuss the various tools available later in the slides. And moving on to modeling, it actually allows us to predict the movement of oil. That's very useful because ultimately you want to know what you're dealing with and where it will go and where it will impact. Lastly, the visualizations brings it all together, presenting response data in an easy to interpret way that allows the incident management team to make informed strategic and tactical decisions. So I think one thing to note is, as technology advances, the tools available for SMV are also continually evolving. So this has changed the landscape for gathering, predicting, and presenting information in the response, allowing us in the spill response to have a better situation awareness, 
as well as improving the efficiency and effectiveness of a response. So what are the reasons why we want to conduct surveillance? I think there are many reasons. Firstly, location. So where is the location of the spill? Is it as reported as it is? Or is it somewhere else? So definitely you want to verify. So therefore, sometimes just now you have to see from the pictures, where is the location, just now I mentioned the coordinates, whether reported on site and when you reach on site by a be it whether an aircraft or surveillance to verify where is the location of the spill or is there any real spill to begin with then we should lead you to also the emanations of a false alarm which just now picture two and picture three so one gives you a red type and the other one gives you an emulsified heavy oil so in certain sense from the picture you will see that they are similar a bit of orange uh, brown substances so do you think that is oil or not? So we definitely need to set eyes on scenes to verify all the details, to eliminate all the false positivities. So such as the algae, the billboards, the conversion zones. Sometimes it's not really that visible like the red or the brownish substance. It can be just the conversion lines, or even the seagrass, or even the cloud shadows. So I think next will be the origin. Just now we just want to pinpoint, is it actually comes from the responding party or is it maybe it's actually by another nearby uh, vessels or any installations that can cause this spill. So sometimes it may not be you or the responding party to or the suspected responding party to be. So everything you need to be verified. Definitely I think you see some movement. So I think a tool will help us, the modeling will help us in terms of the movement. You know, he wants to know after one hour, three hours, one day, five days, where does the oil actually move to? Do you actually move to more sensitive areas? Or where, the, where is it impacted the next time? Maybe in five hours time, one day time, it will hit, hit the shoreline that is very sensitive to the country or to the environment. So in terms of weathering process, so you know that once oil spilled into the environment, it will change its behaviors in terms of physical and chemical properties. So you want to know whether it evaporated, whether it actually emulsified just now, or even it actually it spread, or even it actually sink to the seabed if it's a very heavy crude oil. So something that you want to, to know, what will be happening to the weathering process. Next will be the site prioritizations. So as you know, where's the movement of the oil, you want to prioritize the area that you want to focus on for the operations, because sometimes the spill volume or the extent of the oil may be uh, over a large area. So you may not have such so many resources to respond. So you would like to make some site prioritizations. So this comes with the information, you will know which are the areas to focus first. And subsequently, as days goes by, when the resources comes in, you will be able to react accordingly. So you will not be able to deploy all the resources to all the impacted areas. Definitely some site prioritizations you will need to. Planning. So you definitely, with all the information you gather, you were able to plan where you want to respond, uh, where are the resources going to, then coming into operational support. So can the surveillance provide guidance to the response vessels or the shoreline teams to guide them onto the areas where the thickest oil is? So these are all talking about operational support. Later, I will show one example to give a better context. And lastly, more often, we want to do for reporting. So reports to the regulators, to the governments, or even the internal reporting, or even to the media, or public will be very interested. So you would need to all these kind of information to give a uh, to make sound decisions as well as to disseminate the information to the concerned party. So give you once, I think we expand on the operational support. So as you can see from the picture here, a helicopter is tasked to guide the vessels during a containment and recovery operations. So I think it can be used to direct response assets to response during the, I think to recover the oil and also to, con to contain and recover the oil it's built. So they need to maybe to target the heaviest oil concentrations. So in such a large extent 
of oiling. So where you want to focus first, so you want to target those heaviest uh, oil concentrations. So maybe the civilians can actually help you to do so. And you want to improve on the encounter rates because certain areas, if there's very, I would say that uh, dispersed oil or even uh, there's one more sparse locations or very thin, thin concentrations, you want to move to the heaviest, uh, thickest oil concentrations to collect or to contain and recover more oil. So I think that will help you to improve the encounter rates. Increasing response efficiency, as I mentioned, also so to validate the techniques. So whether the C containment and recovery is effective, or you actually need to consider even using of this person. So all these response strategies will be covered by Nobel later. So moving on to what is the available surveillance tools. So if you're looking at there will be this picture give you a very good from the space to the surface and to the subsurface. So definitely you can see some satellites from the space that is talking about the sensors and also on in the air, the helicopters, the aircraft, the drones that is very popular nowadays. And on the land, you want to send some onshore observers to actually to see if you actually uh, to see what is the extent of oiling, where are the impacted shorelines. So often there's one strategy is looking at the shoreline cleanup uh, assessing techniques. So there's something that uh, you want to consider. Or even on the sea surface, you want to deploy vessels uh, with the observer, or even is the titter balloon systems. And to the sea bait, which is the uh, ROV, the remotely operated vehicles, or even the AUV autonomous uh, un underwater vehicles, or even the unmanned underwater vehicles. So this gives you a better picture in real life. We are talking about the on the surface the satellites using the radar and as well as for the optical imagery. So usually we use radar for more on the offshore in the oil spill response because even in the night or even in the poor weather conditions can give a wide overview of the spill area. So aircraft, be it a fixed wing or a helicopter or twin propeller, it can give you a good context on what it's uh, what's happening with a trade observer. So they're able to give into terms of the quantifications. So I think next, I think it's the upcoming would be the drones. So it's actually the unmanned uh, vehicles and can, if you cover a wide range in a shorter time. So I think one concern is always the limitations by the permission to fly because you need to deconflict the airspace and not certain area is actually restricted. So I think it will be country specific. So different countries have their own, um, I would say that uh, specifications or requirements to fly a drone. And moving on to the vessels. So I think the vessels are straightforward. You will deploy a nautical survey to what is the extent of the oiling, what is the appearance of the oil to be like, whether it has emulsified, give a close up uh, observations, details. And even you can actually deploy a aerostat, which is a balloon, heater balloon. They're able to see, as you can see from the, the slides here, or even a kite. And lastly, these actually the autonomous underwater vehicles is actually works like sometimes uh, to operate actually like a drone by some underwater. So all of these is actually increasing in water surveillance uh, will be actually quite popular and also going undergoing through rapid uh, technological developments. So I think in terms of advance of their sensors, uh, also how the hosing platforms or even the software systems that you can able to view the actual in live feeds, just like the drone. So you can make a small, I would say that uh, informed decisions and the fast decisions. So all these different incidents, I think the in-water surveillance is actually very important for mon monitoring of the oil spill and also the dispersion effectiveness. Well, sometimes you can see on the sea surface, but the under subsea surface, it is something that I think it's always you want to have a, a the understanding on the progress whether it's efficient if you actually can stop at the seabed is there's a pipeline leakage and what's going on under i mean in the sea will be very helpful so i have to say that this technology is actually evolving as i mentioned in the very earlier slides so we are getting more and more tools that will help us to facilitate all the uh i would say that response 
operations and also give a better guidance. So some additional surveillance equipment in terms of sensors will be the colored photography, which is the digital normal cameras, even for the sight looking airborne radars, the ultraviolet, or even the thermal infrared. So these are the some of the tools. We're not getting very technical, but at least this you know that you can request it, and these are all the ongoing surveillance equipment available in the market. So moving on to area surveillance, the one that you need uh, observers. So you have agreed with me that having a pair of eyes in the air will give you a good pictures of the extent of the spill on site. So there's one term, monitor and evaluate that always comes to you. So actually it refers to the ongoing surveillance tasking. So for example, just now we mentioned about determining the location of the spill, observe the condition of the spill, how much oil is still present, are you able to give quantifications of the volume of oil on site? Or has it been going through the weathering process, naturally dispersing, emulsifying, or it has actually impacted the shoreline or any or even the wildlife? So whether a known issue with assets has been escalated, it can be one of your observations made. So different situations will result in different kind of tasking. So it be it whether it's the verifications or even the quantifications tasking. So since the color of the oil itself, as well as the optic effects are influenced by the meteorological conditions, which is the altitude, the angle of observations, or even the color of the sun, or an appearance cannot be categorized purely in terms of its apparent color. So you sometimes you say this color will be red, blue, or silvery, metallic, gray, or very thin, very thick. So different people have different kind of standards. So therefore, this bond agreement oil appearance code has been developed. It's able to give you consistency in describing the color appearance of the oil and also to calibrate between the area surveillance observer in providing an estimate of the oil volumes. So this is certain, just now I mentioned that's the picture one. You see that many people think that it's uh, oil. Yes, and I say that it's actually a rainbow sheet. So I see how we actually derive if we actually from the bond agreement oil appearance code. So from the thinness, from the sheen, to the rainbows, metallic, these continuous true colors, continuous true colors, that will be the five codes, five color codes. And the last thing, others will be the emulsions. So we do not actually give a thickness to the emulsions oil. Um, so, but we do have to note on the color appearance. And usually emulsified oils give you a very brown and orange color, but we're not able to, unlikely we are able to get a uh, oil thickness to it. So I just want to share one uh, experience I have for the recent spill that I attended, as uh, Norma has mentioned, in the Sri Lanka. So I was deployed as an area surveillance uh, observer. So I was on the helicopter conducting air missions. So maybe give you a context how this has been done. So firstly, you will be predicting the oil slick. So just now, I think we have one software, which is the modeling software. They're able to help you to predict oil slick. So we will have this search box, as you can see from the screen. You will define a search box. Then this is the location of the spill. We will actually fly there to actually conduct a localized search. So I thought, so this is during the COVID times. So we can see that actually everyone's wanting a appropriate PPE to reduce the skin contacts or minimize the skin contacts between people present in the helicopters. So I think we, could, we conduct a localized search within the search box. Then you, when you arrive on scenes, you see the conditions, the extents, how where's the directions of the oil moving towards. Then you can give a spill quantifications in terms of just now using the color code that I have. You define the oil area, you define the color appearance of the oil and you're able to associate a certain thickness to it and ultimately able to give your quantifications of the oil volume. It's all estimations, just remember, because it's just observed. It's an observation made by the observer. So some close-up oil, so definitely you want to fly, I mean, closer to the oil and can take some pictures and also to know what is the actual color appearance and to direct operational support. So I just give you a spoiler here. There's something that I marked in the circle. 
later part when Nobel thing show you his share with his experience in Sri Lanka, you were able to see what is this. So actually, when you do a area surveillance, you, you spot certain certain anomalies, you want to feedback this information to the back to the incident uh, management team or the EO, I mean I would say the command center. Then from there you actually can deploy resources on shore to verify what is it about. So lastly, definitely we want to do recording and reporting. So when I arrive back, uh, I need touch down on ground, I will give a call back to the command center to report what I have seen before I actually come up with a report to see what is the track that I actually I fly to and give you certain pictures on the, the locations, what happens to the oil, what's the appearance, and what's the extent of the oil. I think that gives you a good I think summary on what is actually surveillance about, why we want to do it, and what are the tools available, and also my sharing of my experience on how to conduct uh, aerial surveillance missions. So moving on to modeling. I think we know that time is the essence in the response. So if you want to know what it's done and what can be done for the first 24 hours, which is critical, and to make an efficient and effective response. So I think oil spill modeling actually attempts to capture how the oil interacts with the natural environment. So it is able to estimate where the oil will travel and how the chemicals and physical properties of the oil will change with time. I think general rule of time, of thumb is 100% on the current of and the speed of the directions of this uh, of the spill, then also 3% wind speed and directions, and you're able to plot the trajectory, which gives you where does this oil move to. So it's very simple, very, very I would say that mathematical and uh, can do by manual plotting. But if you want to know what happens to one day, uh, two days later, then likely you would require software. So what is required to run an oil spill model? Definitely you want to know the positions of release. So you give a latitude and longitude for the coordinates, as well as if you know the depth, the depth actually is for the surface uh, modeling, it is required. So moving on to the spill details. So it's the date when it happens, why is the estimate volume? Because if you're from a pipeline, you know, uh, after you shut out the valve, what is the amount in your pipeline that actually really uh, maybe leak into the environment? Or even from the vessels, you already know how much uh, oil product you carry and you give the worst case scenarios and different estimations. Maybe one tank has breached, two tanks has breached. So you will give an estimate quantity so that we can run the models. So in the model duration, which means whether is it uh, instantaneous or it's still ongoing so certain that you cannot stop the source you will have to be a, it's an ongoing release so you will have to know this kind of information definitely the oil type uh, likely you can get all these informations from your oil asset sheets that you will be provided so likely we will require that you can able to provide us with all asset sheets so that we can actually get information from there so and so if you know about the all the rest of is the Temperature on release, diameters of release holes, gas liquid ratios, the gas densities. If you are talking about the gas, the gas plume uh, modeling that we are going for, suspended sediments, load of water. So this is certain uh, parameters that you require. But I think there are some differences between the surface and the subsurface modeling. So I think definitely subsurface will require more details. But later, I'm mean, gonna show a. Uh, I think the surface modeling, then I think they'll be more straightforward and less so, and they're able to produce at a faster pace for the report. Definitely, you will need some map oceans data, which is the wind and current. Just like I mentioned, you will need 100% wind, oh, sorry, 100% current and 3% wind as the general rule of thumb. So, all this will be input into the software and can provide you with the trajectory. So, certain oil spill modelings uh, in OSRL, there will be the 3D in the say that it's including a subsurface will be on the OSCAR. And for the surface, we'll be actually using an oil map. So there are still many available uh, kind of um, oil spill modeling software out there, but these are the two general that is used by OSRL. So what is a trajectory modeling? So actually, a trajectory is actually a single model run. It's run on a particular date and timestamp. 
So trajectory modeling is often requested that it tell us where the oil go and under those conditions that we input. So this also it had tell us what will happen to the oil during the model run. So I think this refers to the weathering process and also the fit of oil. So you know that certain like evaporations or even a biodegradations, emulsifications or stranding, uh, they can happen or even impacting the shorelines. So with the outcome, it helps in decision making and prioritizing of resources. So as the spill continues, uh, trajectory can be run daily with updated weather data and spill details. So what is it used for? I think we can use it in spill and exercises. So I think with more certain and real-time data, such as the spill locations, the type of oil product, the amount of oil spill, current and wind data, you can know within the next few days, it, it would impact any shoreline. If yes, where and where will it hit the first shoreline? Then how much oil is left on the water surface? Would it cross any maritime boundaries that you need to inform the relevant uh, government authorities? So also, will the dispersion applications likely or unlikely to be effective if viscosity of the oil exceeds 10,000 cent stroke? So from the oil, from the model output, I think it helps us to develop response strategies and identify resources needed. So if the shoreline is likely to impact then one will have to think if shoreline cleanup uh, operation is required in addition of the at sea containment and recovery. So if the oil get too viscous, will one still consider this person's application or put more resources on me mechanical means using the offshore booms and schemas. So all these information can enable informed decisions making during a response. So moving on to stochastic. So what is this stochastic uh, modeling? is actually a combination of numbers of different trajectories. So trajectory is only one run, but stochastic is actually a combination of different trajectories uh, between the, maybe we're looking at 80 to even 300 individual runs. They tell us what chance there is of the oil going somewhere and it highlights the worst possible cases. So I think the standard worst case are the most oil assured, assured faster oil to shore and the worst case. So these are then run as individual trajectories, different time uh, line, uh, different seasons, different conditions, then you overlay together uh, as to form one stochastic modeling. So I think it's often used in the oil spill contingency planning. So was you know that to run 80 or even up to 100 uh, trajectories, it will take time. So it's not something that you want to do it during the reactive phase. So if the oil really spilled into the environment, you want the information to fast, you will, you will likely to, you can run a stochastic, it depends on what kind of information you are looking into. Maybe it's an ongoing spill and you want to know, uh, I would say it's a very large extent or large spill, then it's ongoing and you know that going to months even, then you may want to consider stochastics. If not, actually, trajectory is the one that we always go for in terms of response in the spill. So, in a nutshell, you can see that you will, it's the same, you will identify what is the release scenarios. So, you may look into even different seasons or even different uh, timeline you are talking about. Then, you will run the same scenario under different conditions. Then, you have a combined the results to create a stochastic output. So you will look slightly different from a trajectory, but trajectory is like telling you where the oil will move to, but this is telling you the changes where the oil will go. So some key points to note because we are talking about predictions. So you will know that predicts changes in oil characteristics under a variety of environmental uh, conditions. So it will change every day and likely the result may change or the direction may change. So model use wind, tides and current uh, to predict the trajectory. So sometimes if you're able to have the real-time data or the as real, I mean, if not, it's a forecast, if certain of the, I would say the degree of accuracy may vary. So however, we will just need to know a general direction. So if the oil moves to these directions, it will actually serve as a guide. So would, the area surveillance will sit in to see where actually it will be used or it will be located. So just to verify whether the modern results is accurate. So at least it can give you a, I would say a direction.
how you actually define a search box, as I mentioned just now. So if you want to conduct missions, you need to know a search box. And a modeling can be able to predict the movement and you can actually define a search box for your operations. So definitely you need to validate and update as the spill progressed. So lastly is the visualizations that we are talking about. I have these numbers and the south and the east thing. So with the coordinates, are you able to tell me exactly where this located? I think this gives you a very good representation why we need visualizations. So if I convert, I plot these coordinates into the Google Earth, into somewhere else, you actually can know that it's actually somewhere very close to your heart. It's the Timor Leste area and I actually point to uh, the greatest sunrise uh, platforms. So visualization is the actual data itself, or rather is the means and the communication of data. So it can be a, just a mental imagery. So it could be an image, diagram, or animations that communicates a message. Then what is common operating pictures? So Visualization is how we view the outputs of the model as well as other response data. But a common operating picture is a computing platform based on the graphical information systems that provides a single source of data and information for situational awareness, coordinations, communications, and data to support emergency management and response personnel and other stakeholders involved in or affected by it. Accidents. So these are the definitions. So we can see that there's the different platform available, which is the maybe it's the Google Earth or even the Arches. So to expand the view, that what should be included in the common operating pictures is a consolidated and integrated single platform that display what and where things are happening in real time feeds. So from the planning, operations to finance and logistics. So you just want a single platform that actually able to gather all the data and everyone can view it from this platform to actually make certain decisions, be it the operational or even the technical uh, decisions. So some of them can be like on the ground, you will have all the uh, map and overlays on the video feeds, then the shoreline status reports, and you want to put in the sensitive areas. So when the oil predicts or the modeling predicts where it goes, whether you will keep your sensitivities, then maybe you want to you already actually input all the satellite imagery with all the coordinates. So you want to put it in. So as over time, you build these common operating pictures. So they give you certain kind of information. So as all the spirits always evolve, you will have all these informations in place to make the decisions. There are certain guides in terms of like there's one by the IPK. So I think you can actually refer to. So there's actually the, the work package and common operating pictures. And it give you very good information. And this is why you want to do and visualize the response data. Definitely, just like I mentioned, is actually accepted and integrated components of the effective oil spill response. You provide the strategic information, it presents all the data in a single place. Then you make complex data more accessible, understandable, and usable. And it communicates to others. And actually somehow it brings out the trends, the patterns or how it moves or correlations that might go undetected in certain text-based data. So again, it will help to make robust decisions of the data. And lastly, you from just now talking about visualizations and common operating pictures, there's certain differences. So visualizations, we are talking about the data itself. It can be just one image one uh, diagram or one animations videos that able to communicate a message so it's a mental imagery so you must just now from the very first i think uh slides from the visualization the numbers may not mean anything if you do not know where is it or you cannot visualize where is the location whereas for the common operating pictures it's a platform for displaying and disseminating that data so it should be user friendly because you want to easy access for all these complex data, and it should be in a single platform. You do not want everybody to find or hunt everywhere for this data, and it should be in a real-time fix, because so that you can make more robust 
uh, decisions or informed decisions. So it should be a tool which actually, like I said, that gives you a better situational awareness. So it's for those decision makers or the incident commanders back in the command centers to make the sound decisions to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of the response. So I think with that, I think I give you a very, I will say that it's a very high level on what is surveillance modeling and visualizations. I hope um, I actually achieved the three, you still remember the three objectives up there to list the, the surveillance tools to able to differentiate between a trajectory and a stochastic modeling. And lastly, what is actually the visualizations and have a better features, what is the common operating features. So I think that's all from me. Thank you for having me here. So I miss you, Norman, <laughs> telling me I'm the overrun. So um, hello, thanks, 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 Puyang. Uh, yeah, so actually we have a, a number of questions with regards to the surveillance, modeling, and uh, visualization. Um, I will read that to you later during the plenary and have a look at those messages also so that you can prepare your answers later. But a quick question for you, Puyang. Um, based on your experience, I, I know you have been into a number of skills already. And most of the time, I know you have been doing aerial surveillance as part of your response. So based on your experience, um, how important it is to have this surveillance or surveillance modeling visualization as part of a response strategy? Yes, I think I already answered in my slides earlier on, if you have noticed. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a test for So I think through my experience, as you know that I think it's, I mentioned a very important message. It really is the most, I think often it's the most important, I uh, would say that capability or the elements that we'll utilize in the tip partners and response wheel. So I think it gives you a very good, uh, I think I'll say that um, it set the scene or it gives you uh, information, provide the onsets of the incidents. So I think for myself, it's something that when I receive a call, was I also a duty manager? So I received the call from the responding party. So I want to understand what what is going on, what happens, where it does the oil goes. So all these informations will be required, and often modeling will be the first one that people will, but the responding party will require it. So we will run the model, give, and within maybe within a few hours, then you will get the information that likely where the oil will go, and able to send certain area surveillance or people on the ground to go to in that directions to verify the information. So definitely, I would say that this is one of the first two that you want first, to analyze yeah. yeah. during a response. So I think then so that when you receive all the data, if I think it's set nicely in place, modeling, verify by the area surveillance, then lastly will be how you want to, I would say that uh, collect the data and display in your command centers, which lead to visualizations. So I think definitely this is something that is very important to set the scene for your uh, response or incident management. So basically, this is the first, I would say, one of the first strategies that you're going to use uh, in, 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 in the event of an oil spill. That's right. All right. Good. Thanks, Priyan. So please join us later on the uh, plenary. Uh, and to all our participants, uh, please check your chat box, our um, platform administrator will be sharing the link to the attendance and feedback form. So for those, um, uh, you can indicate on the attendance form whether you require an electronic certificate and we request the participants to complete and submit the form after the webinar. All right, so thank you everyone. Um, okay, so without further ado, we now understood uh, surveillance modeling and visualization as a response strategy now we would, I would invite Nobel uh, to talk about the other OSP response strategies. So Nobel, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks, Norman. Uh, good morning, everyone. Just give me one minute. Uh, let me share the screen. All right. I hope everyone can hear me loud uh, and clear, and uh, you can see the shared screen. Um, for my PowerPoint slides. Okay, so I'll be presenting, my name is Nobel, I'll be presenting on OSPO response strategies. 
So first things first, I uh, would like to talk about the objectives, uh, very similar to Koi Hang's presentation. So first thing is to list, to be able to list different response strategies at the end of the, this session and to understand how to, um, how to select the response strategies for different type of spill um, correctly and to understand and discuss the benefits and limitations of um, each and every response strategies that I'm talking about in this session. So when we talk about response strategies, uh, the first thing that, um, that we should have in our mind is the cone of response. But what is the cone of response is the, is basically um, talking about different response strategies that, um, that base, it goes outward from the incident location. So you can see here in the incident location that um, if, for example, if this, uh, the spill is a, um, an incident well blow out, then um, what first we have to think about, it, we can think about is source control, um, maybe subsea operations like subsea dispersing injection. Then we think about fluorometry where we verify the effectiveness of the subsea dispersing injection. And moving upwards um, from the incident location, we have the containment and recovery. Maybe we can catch and recover some of these oil slicks that we uh, might have missed out from the subsidies person injection. Uh, and then if we are doing containment and recovery, we will have an offshore command and staging area as well. And we have area surveillance and area dispersant um, um, out in the outer area of what it, for area surveillance, uh, I'm sure Poi Hang has already highlighted the importance of area surveillance and area support that, you know, it, it, how important it is and what, what are the different uses of it. So area support can also help um, the containment and recovery or even um, vessel dispersant, for example, which I'll be talking about in the next few slides. So um, just uh, to have a bit of uh, thinking on what are different type of uh, response strategies that we can apply in a in a spill um, in different areas of the spill, and we, we obviously in the shoreline, if the oil has impacted the shoreline, we have shoreline operations like shoreline protection and shoreline um, cleanup operations and uh, shoreline survey to 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 make sure that uh, the correct resources are going to the correct locations. Okay. So moving on, I uh, will be diving uh, straight into our offshore surface dispersants. So this slide is just a brief overview of what is a dispersant basically. So dispersant have two components mainly. So the first component is sol solvent carrier. So what, what is it is that th this solvent carrier just maintains dispersant in liquid uh, so that we can, you know, spray it onto oil. And the next component is a surfactant molecule. So what is the surfactant? So it's basically a sh it's basically short for surface active agent. But what it does is that there is two parts of this surfactant molecule. There is a water seeking head group. We call it hydrophilic and oleophilic, which is the tail of this molecule, which is oil seeking. So because of these two components. It breaks down and um, basically reduce the oil water interfacial tension. So by reducing this, um, it will remove oil from the water surface and break down the oil into smaller droplets into the water column, about five to 10 meters in the water column. So by doing so, this will increase the natural biodegradation of the oil. So um, if we leave the oil in the water long enough, there is natural biodegradation, but if we um, separate them, disperse them, distribute them into the water column, this will increase the effectiveness of the, the natural biodegradation. So now that we know uh, what is um, dispersant, before we think about um, you know, using them in, in an oil spill or having this dispersant operation, we have to think about a few considerations. So first things first, the most important thing is uh, regulatory approvals. So if it is if the if there's no approval from any regulation, then we can't use this person at all in an oil spill. So basically, um, general rule of thumb: regulatory approval is usually given typically 
for about uh, one nautical mile beyond a 20 meter depth contour. The next consideration that we should think about is the dispersion and oil ratio. So depending on the type of oil and the type of dispersion, um, it is very important that you get the correct dispersion oil ratio to make sure that um, your operation is the most efficient. You're not overusing or underusing uh, dispersant. So typically, uh, the oil ratio dispersant is about uh, dispersant to oil ratio is about one is to twenty. So one part of dispersant is to twenty parts of oil for um, the common dispersant type, which is type two and three. So next I'll uh, be talking about this, we can discuss about uh, disadvantages and advantages of the dispersion. So what are the advantages? It is a rapid response and we can cover a large area, especially if we're using something like aerial dispersion. And why is it re rapid response is that um, it is much more similar and less, I uh, would say bulky than um, if you compare it to an, uh, containment and recovery. I'll be talking about containment and recovery in the next few slides as well. So it reduces uh, waste and improved biodegradation. I've mentioned that already. So the reason why it reduces waste is basically we're not putting any equipment into the oil and we're not recovering any oil or waste. So it basically reduces the amount of waste generated in an oil spill response. It can operate in a rougher sea or weather. So if you're just, um, for example, if you're using uh, area dispersant, even if the sea is a little bit rough, um, uh, if it is not suitable for containment and recovery, let's say, we can still spray dispersion application in a rougher sea or weather. And for even for emulsified oil, um, dispersion can actually break down or reduce further emulsification. But then again, um, there is up to a certain limit and time window for dispersion to be effective. So if let's say the emulsification has increased the oil's viscosity up to more than 10,000 semi-stokes, then this person might not be effective anymore. But then again, it's just a general rule of thumb. And uh, uh, the best way to make sure that if, if it works or not is to get a sampling and um, try it out um, to see if this person is effective in an oil spill. So what are the disadvantages? So oil is removed, it is not removed, but it is redistributed. So as mentioned before in the previous slide, um, we're not uh, containing and recovering the oil, but we are redistributing it into the water column. So that leads to the next um, disadvantage, which uh, if you use it near a sensitive resource, for example, coral reefs or farm fishes, because we are redistributing the oil and making it to smaller droplets into the, into the water column, it might be toxic and um, has have an adverse effect on these sensitive resources. Okay, and I've also mentioned um, time window for effective use. So if let's say, if we leave, if the, the spill has been um, a few days or a few weeks, if the oil has been on the water surface for um, quite a, a long period of time where the emulsification has increased the viscosity, um, it might to more than 10,000 centimeters, it might, this, this person might not be effective anymore. And uh, as I mentioned before, it, uh, we, we generally don't recommend to use this uh, dispersion in shallow water because we're pushing, um, we're distributing the oil into the low, into the, into the water column. So if, it, if the water is too shallow, then there might not be enough volume for this uh, redistributing of, re redistribution of oil in the water column. So I hope this uh, clears up a few question and idea, give you a bit of idea of what is this person. So I've got a few photos of uh, this person application in this slide. So you can see um, in your top left corner, it's a, a vessel dispersion application. And the next two photos on the right is basically aerial surveillance. And um, um, this photo you can see here is the uh, aerial dispersion. So the fixed wind aircraft uh, goes really close to the water surface to do this dispersion spraying. So it helps when uh, there is a spotter aircraft as what um, Hu Yang has mentioned before to guide these vessels and uh, even the fixed wing uh, air dispersion aircraft to guide them uh, to the correct locations and correct directions where the, the oil slick is. 
And uh, as an alternative, there's also a heli bucket option for this person in Picasso. This is just a, a nice, a, a good video to give you an example of what a, a, a vessel dispersion application looks like. So you can see the color of the oil. It looks like some sort of like coffee color. So um, coffee color in, in terms of visual uh, uh, monitoring, coffee color for oil, it shows that the dispersion application has been effective. Obviously, uh, if you use fluorometry, it will give you uh, more accurate results. So let's move on to institute burning. So what is institute burning? So basically, um, it's this burning uh, controlled, very important, the word controlled. So it is controlled combustion of hydrocarbons vapors. So we're burning the vapor, not the oil itself. So you can use it on land, snow, or ice, or even, uh, I mean, as land, snow, ice, and water surface. And we um, institute burning, we call it ISB as well. So uh, as short form, uh, most of the time we call it ISB. So similar to this person, what are the considerations that we need to think about before we use ISB operation? So in this case, um, uh, oil characteristics is very important as well. So minimum slick thickness and emulsification content in oil is are the characteristics that we look for to, to see if ISB is suitable um, response strategy. So for minimum slick thickness, it should be around one to two millimeter to make sure that the heat doesn't escape too much into the water below the oil, to make sure that um, the, the, uh, the heat can sustain the burning. And the, if there's uh, too much water in the oil, too much emulsification content in the oil, and um, it, it will be hard for this, the, the fire, to, the, the burning to sustain for a longer period. And obviously the next um, consideration is location. So we need to think about where, if we're burning, um, we need to think about where the smoke that, that comes out from the burn leads to. So, if the trajectory is towards a residential, um, in, a, in a nutshell, it should be more than five kilometers. And obvi but obviously there are a lot of other constraints like monitoring, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit more about in the next slide. And obviously uh, distance from other combustibles. So if we're burning, um, for example, close to a, a well blowout, which is a continuous uh, release, um, this smoke may contain sparks of um, fire, which may you know spread and make uh, make this um, controlled burning become uncontrolled burn. So we it is very important to make sure that th this doesn't happen. And for in situ burning, uh, weather is very important as well. So there's a certain limit for wind. It should be less than about eighteen to twenty knots for wave and current. Um, generally, wave it should be about less than one meter high and current about one knot. So we're talking about uh, a generally calm weather and sea. Okay. Then last but not least, the most important thing, very similar to this person, we need to get approval from the legislation and regulation, the local legislation and regulations. Without approval, we cannot just burn the oil. Right? So what are the what are the uh, disadvantages and advantages of in situ burning? So advantages: rapid removal of oil. But since we're burning it, it's a lot faster. Uh, high efficiency rates. Um, we're getting the fire do all the job for us. Less amount of waste generated. Less equipment and labor capable for oil mixture with debris. So even with debris, unlike for example recovering the oil, since we're burning it, um, is capable to do that. Minimal waste and oil storage required since we're not um, recovering any um, oil then, so we will have minimal waste required. So what are the disadvantages? Obviously environmental concerns. Since we're burning it, there is air pollution and also water pollution because um, like I mentioned before, if the oil is too, oil thickness is too thin, um, the fire will not be able to burn anymore. So we, the, some of the oil will be left behind, we call it residue, but, um, from researchers, um, we we found that residue the residue is actually a lot less harmful than the unburned oil because all the VOCs and other harmful gases has been uh, most of them have been has been burned off by the uh, residue burning. 
And the next one, like I mentioned before, very important, risk of loss of fire control. So we have to make sure that this is controlled burning and to make sure it doesn't become uncontrolled burning. It needs optimum weather conditions, as mentioned before, and safety concerns, obviously, for public and also responder safety and health. So moving on to containment and recovery. So we talked about dispersion, we talked about in-situ burning. So let's talk about um, at sea containment and recovery, or sometimes we call it offshore operation. So for um, what can we, what this is just a brief overview of containment and recovery. So where can we use it? We can use it offshore and near shore in like harbors and uh, uh, even um, in the Delta region near the, uh, the sea opening. Um, full recovery can be difficult to achieve because we're using skimmer and de depending on different type of oil. Um, recovering 100% of oil on the water surface can be very difficult to achieve. The operation is limited by weather because we are containing the oil with boom. And if we're using skimmers on the water surface, if the, the weather, the sea is too choppy, then this might not be uh, very ideal. Um, response time, it may take uh, a lot longer than the, the first two response strategies that we've just talked about. Recovery efficiency, I mentioned before, uh, it might be hard to recover 100%. And what are the resources that we might require in a containment and recovery vessel of opportunity? Um, equipment, booms, skimmers, we might need them local or from overseas. Trained manpower, because these booms and skimmers, they, are not, uh, they, they might need as, uh, expertise from um, someone um, like our hospital responders. Recovered oil storage. So this is actually very important. Waste management is usually um, one of the most uh, typical bottleneck in a in an offshore operation. So um, waste management and uh, oil disposal has to be. Uh, I have to have highlight that uh, this has to be considered uh, thoroughly in a uh, containment recovery operation. So in this slide, you can see a few offshore booming of, uh, formations. Um, these are just uh, uh, diagrams of, uh, so you can see on the top left corner, this is the J formation. So basically two um, vessels required, um, one towing support vessel and uh, one uh, deployment and mother vessel, which will, which is uh, positioned closer to the, to the APEC. That's why it's in the J formation, so that's where the mother vessel can collect the oil. And in the next photo you see here in the middle is uh, the U formation where three vessels are uh, used in this case. And um, um, two towing vessel, one, uh, one towing vessel, one uh, uh, deployment vessel and another vessel for recovery. And on the top right corner you see here is the site sweep system where just a single vessel is used uh, where it does both containment and recovery at the same time. So this is more suitable for like smaller targeting those smaller slicks. And uh, uh, in, the, in the bottom left corner, you see here is the V formation where it uses a specialized uh, response vehicle, uh, vessel to, to collect the oil that is contained by these two vessel in the V formation. So these are just a few uh, good photos to give you an idea of what it actually looks like um, in real life or containment and recovery. So you can see in this photo here, this is a, um, a site sweep system, okay, site sweep system. And um, in the top right corner, um, this is um, a collection, um, most likely this is a J formation where um, the collection recovery of the oil is being done at the the apex of the the J formation boom. Okay, and this this uh, in the bottom left corner you see here is booming around the vessel to contain the the spill at the source. So um, since you know since you now know about um, different type of formation, let's talk about different type of booms. So there are different type of booms in um, in res different uh, responses. So um, let's talk about rigid or fence boom. Sometimes we call it solid flotation boom. So what are the um, good things and bad things about this boom is that it's quick to deploy. You don't have to uh, inflate it. 
since this uh, already solid flotation type boom. So it functions well in a calm sea, but because it is a uh, solid flotation, you, or you, you cannot deflate it, it requires a significant storage space. And due to the shape and design of this type of boom, it has a less effective wave following characteristics than the inflation boom. Let's talk about inflation curtain boom now. So this is um, uh, a diagram of uh, inflation curtain boom. So we have a air flotation chamber and a skirt with a uh, ballast chain, which uh, will, help, will help to contain the oil. So one of the good things is that it has a good wave following characteristics of the sh because of the shape and uh, the weight um, of the, uh, the that's provided by the ballast chain. Um, you can deflate it for storage, so you can actually put in like um, 150 meter in an aircraft pellet. So it, you you require a lot less storage space comparing to solid flotation booms. But because we, we need to inflate it before we um, deploy it, um, ancillaries will be required, such as like air blowers. Next, we have shore ceiling boom. So this is, um, as it sounds like, it's mainly used in shoreline, for example, like beaches, sunny beaches. So it's a good um, effective barrier in intertidal areas because um, this, this type of boom, shore ceiling boom, have uh, typically three chambers one air chamber and two water chambers. So this two water chamber help with the ceiling of the, of the beach or the intertidal area. And again, similar to the previous type um, um, uh, inflation curtain boom, you can deflate it for storage. So you need a lot less space comparing to a solid uh, flotation type boom. Um, but the disadvantage of this is, is, uh, is poor ceiling on rocks. So if we're using on rock, we have to be mindful of this. It can be easily damaged by sharp objects because the entire boom is made of um, different uh, chambers, air chambers and water chambers. So um, um, if we put it on sharp objects or like sharp rocks, it can damage the boom and uh, it requires more ancillary. So since we're, we have to inflate it using air and water, so we, we will need both um, air blowers and uh, uh, water pipes. And lastly, we have absorbent boom. So this, I think, is the most um, common and um, in, 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 the, in the market or in the industry. So it, this, this type of boom is usually used to assist other type of shoreline boom. So if, let's say, for example, if we're using a shore ceiling boom and because of the gradient of the, the, the beach, um, there's a gap that the shore ceiling boom is um, unable to seal. You can use this absorbent boom to seal off the uh, to help to assist this the shoreline deployment. It's uh, and it's a very simple deployment, useful for small spills as well. But the problem with it is uh, it contribute to generation of waste since it absorbs the oil. So the entire boom itself become the oily waste, and it's not for long term use because um, these type of boom have a limit in the, the amount of oil it can absorb and the amount of while it can stay uh, float in, in the water. So I have a, a small, uh, short interactive quiz prepared for everyone. So please scan the QR code, or you can actually go to menti.com and type in this code. And I'll also be sharing the, uh, the link if, uh, if you don't wanna use your smartphone for this quiz. Let me just um, change the sharing screen. Get a link for everyone. Okay. In the wrong slide, sorry. Okay. Uh, everyone managed to um, get into the slide, get into the uh, the quiz. 
I see about four. I'll just give about um, 30 seconds for everyone to uh, scan this and uh, come to this, to this uh, the quiz. Please, I encourage everyone to participate in this quiz. You see more people joining? Right, so I hope everyone is able to join this quiz. Um, in the interest of time, I'll be, um, uh, let's get right into the quiz. Let me start the countdown of 10 seconds. So basically it's showing, um, I've, I've given you um, different type of booms and uh, what do you think is the most suitable for offshore wise bill like you see in this, this photo. Here. Okay, so the correct answer is inflation curtain boom. So I can see most of you got it right. So that's good. Moving on to next question. So the, the question is, what type of boom you see um, in the option will be most suitable to use in a, in a beach shoreline or ice field? Great, everybody's um, selecting C. Let me start the countdown of 10 seconds. So everybody's choosing the same answer, I guess. Okay, someone choose inflation curtain boom as well. Okay. So the right answer is actually both um, B and C. So um, um, nearer to the shore, uh, we can use the shore ceiling boom and um, towards outwards to the sea, um, inflation curtain boom will be um, used to contain the oil or protect the shoreline from an oil spill. So in this uh, scenario, um, is this an oil spill in a, in a river, for example, in a river? So yeah, so what do you think um, is the most suitable type of oil um, boom? You can choose uh, multiple answers. I'll give it about 30 seconds for everyone to, uh, to choose your answers. So it is very interesting. I, I can see a lot of people have different ideas. So most of the, the all, all different type of boom, all four types of boom have been chosen. So that's very good. All right, let's look at the correct answer. So the correct answer is actually um, all except the shore ceiling boom. So um, usually a shore ceiling boom is, um, is used in those um, like beach or shoreline type of um, um, scenario oil spill. So yes, um, solid flotation boom, solvent boom, inflation curtain boom, all these three, three type of booms can be used for this type of oil spill. So that's all for this uh, quiz. Uh, thank you very much everyone for participating. So let me move um, move back to the, uh, to the slides. Just give me one minute. Okay, let's move on without further ado. So now that we have um, discussed about uh, different type of booms, let's talk about recovery devices. So there's a few different type of recovery devices that we call, we call them skimmers. So we have olefilic, vacuum, manual, mechanical, and wear type skimmers. 
let's go through uh, one by one. So what is an oleophilic type schema? So it's basically um, uh, made up of drums or disc um, that loves water. Oleophilics, if you remember in this person, oleophilic means it loves water and it hates oil. So if you put this in, in the in a in an oil uh, a surface where there's oil and water mix, uh, this type schema will be very efficient in uh, um, in recovering oil. But it, uh, each different schemas have um, um, a suitability for different type of oil. So for this oleophilic type schema, it is more suitable to work with um, light to medium type viscosity oils. Um, the thing about this type of um, skimmer is it can be damaged by this person. So if we've already used this person on an oil spill, um, we we need to be mindful about using this type of skimmer in that in that uh, oil slick that is already been sprayed sprayed with this person, and it is um, a little bit uh, less successful with uh, emulsified oil because of the water content in the emulsified emulsification. Next we have wear skimmer. So basically, um, it has like floats that is designed to design in a in to, to to position itself in the water oil interface, as you can see in this uh, photo. So it can work with light to medium type viscos viscosity oil, but because it's just um, recovering um, at the interface, it, it tends to have a higher water content pickup. So about seven percent of water and 30% of oil, but it is it can be a lot uh, faster than the oleophilic uh, type skimmer, and it is able to recover emulsified oil. I have a video here to give you a better idea of how this skimmer works. So you can see um, that the, the entrance, the where, where the oil is collected is um, positioned at the oil water interface here. So that's how the oil is uh, being sucked into and being recovered. Let's move on to vacuum skimmer. So it's, it's uh, very similar to the, the, you know, the vacuum that you might have at home. So it's just basically just vacuuming the oil, um, uh, maybe shoreline or even near shore oil, uh, oil spills. You can recover any viscosity product. Um, it is a bit more labor intensive than the other type of skimmers. And um, it's the, about the similar type of water pickup to the wear type skimmer, about 70% of water and 30% of oil. And then we have mechanical skimmer. Uh, it is suitable for medium to heavy type uh, products. So um, be because of the, the nature of this type of skimmer, it uses like claws and brushes so it need thick layer of oil to be efficient. So if it is like a medium uh, or uh, light, heavy product, uh, light uh, products, then it might not be effective. Might not be able to pick up the oil into the uh, into the um, in, uh, into the skimmer. It can recover emulsified oil with a very high content of viscosity. It can tolerate debris as well uh, more than, um, uh, for example. Uh, uh, wear type skimmer, um, but it's not efficient for recovery for lighter products like uh, as I mentioned before. And then lastly, you have the manual recovery where you can recover any type of viscosity because mainly you're just using spades and uh, just scooping them up. But um, keep in mind, it's very labor intensive. So after we talk about different type of booms, dispersant, in situ burning, and um, uh, SC containment recovery. Um, last but not least, uh, we will discuss about shoreline cleanup. So shoreline cleanup is usually done in three different stages, stage one, two, three. Stage one is basically skimming, recovering, and pumping of free oil that is uh, on the beach or on shoreline. So this is basically done to prevent the oil from remobilizing. So in shoreline, typically uh, there's a tide, when the tide comes in, the oil comes in and um, we, we have to make sure that we pump in, pump out all this free oil before you know, it gets remobilized with the next coming in tide. And stage two is to 
um, just start cleaning up on the shoreline. And stage two is uh, the final polish where the question is asked of how clean is clean. <clears throat> so for shoreline cleanup, um, it is more of a project management than a deployment. So um, there's a lot of careful planning required, a lot of logical progress more than um, specialist expertise. Uh, a lot of man power intensive, very man power in intensive, logistically demanding. Um, you need logistics to, um, you know, um, uh, for man power to 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 transport the recovered oil back to waste management. It is expensive since it is very man power intensive and a lot of logistics is involved. And um, there's actually different type of varieties of type of shoreline infected, and in fact. Um, getting access, uh, actually getting there for the, to do the site can be an, an issue before you even be able to start cleaning up the site. So just something to be mindful of. So the, um, that's all for all the different type of response strategies that um, are, are in the, for this session. So I'll be sharing a few good case studies um, for my session. So the first case study is an uh, Indonesia well incident that happened in 2019. So this is the uh, incident location and I'll be sharing a bit of a timeline um, of what happened uh, for this incident. So on, on the 12th July, 2019, there was an oil spill um, that uh, originated from drilling activities. So about three days later, the incident was declared an emergency and um, so this oil spill was allegedly caused by a gas leak in uh, one of the offshore block. So the incident location is about two kilometers north of Karawang and is it, uh, due to this, it polluted the North Sea of Karawang, West Java. The spill owner um, deployed um, uh, to, uh, assistance from, with assistance from in-country tier two response company and Boots and Coots to combat the oil spill. And on 23rd of July, about um, 11 days later, OSRL um, received a notification from the spill owner regarding this incident. And um, on the 5th August, OSRL representative uh, is deployed to Jakarta to sign the contract with the spill owner. And uh, after this, the contract was done as non-members agreement, um, on the 22nd of August, OSRO headed down to the spill site to, um, to deploy at sea containment and recovery. So that, um, that is one of the response strategies that we discussed um, in the previous slides, isn't it? So I have a few photos here, a few good photos that uh, was taken during the, um, the, this, the, the oil spill response while uh, some of our staff was there. So this is the... Um, the incident location that you can see in this photo. Uh, this is the shoreline impact uh, from this oil spill. This is actually our octopus skimmer at work in action, um, collecting oil from the apex of the containment recovery. Another good photo of the, our octopus in action. This is a photo of um, our staff um, doing the servicing of the octopus skimmer uh, between each operation day. Uh, in this photo, you can see uh, waste management um, using IBC to, uh, to, to contain the oil that is collected uh, using the skimmers. So we have octopus skimmer on the left and in the middle is the sea devil skimmer that was deployed on site from um, Singapore base. And we have, um, you can see in this photo, a lot of IBCs that we use to, to, to collect the oil from the sea surface. Next, I'll be sharing the Sri Lanka shoreline response 2021. So both of these um, case studies I'm sharing, they are the most recent and the most prominent um, oil spill responses that um, OSRL, especially Singapore base attended in the last few years. So this is actually from last year. I attended to this spill myself. I was the first batch to attend this spill. So what happened is on 20th May, 2021, um, there was uh, explosion chemical fuel emission of a container vessel about nine nautical miles west, northwest of 
Port Colombo in Sri Lanka international water. And um, OSR was notified of this. And what happened is after this explosion, this um, entire vessel was um, on this on the seabed at about a depth of 21 meters. So it's, it's not exactly very deep water. So the, the interesting thing about this oil spill, this spill is that um, other than oil, actually the most impact is the nurdles. So you can see on your right side, these are the nurdles. So basically they are plastic, small plastic pellets or small plastic balls. So there's, there are millions and billions of these nurdles that um, the container ship was carrying. And because of the um, fire and um, explosion, these nurdles uh, were washed up on the uh, western and southern coastline of Sri Lanka. And it actually covered about 300 kilometer of the Sri Lanka coastline. So um, uh, it can be quite devastating for the, the shoreline in Sri Lanka. So I've got a few photos and all of these photos were actually taken by myself uh, while I was uh, responding to this uh, spill. So you can see in this photo here, um, these black uh, plastic, uh, they are molten plastic from the white uh, plastic pellets that uh, you've seen in the previous slide. So they, they, some of them can be very huge. Um, this is one of the um, cleaning method that was carried out during the um, response effort. So this is a sieving method that you use to separate the plastic pellets, uh, the noodles from the dry sand. This is a flotation method where um, we use it for the noodles that are on the wet sand where you just sort of like put a mixture of sand and the noodles in the water where because of the plastic nature, it is lighter than uh, sand. So it, it flows up to this water surface that's where we can uh, separate them out. And this is what uh, Poyang mentioned in her slide. Um, during her area surveillance, she spotted uh, anomaly, a big structure on the shoreline. And I was actually on the ground and I saw it was actually a whole container that was washed up on the shoreline. Uh, in this photo, you can see a bit of um, waste management. That's how the nurdles and bigger molten plastics are being collected and um, transported to the warehouse for waste management. This is also um, another a very useful method of um, separating the nurdles and cleaning the beach. So this is called a trummel. Um, it's very common in uh, beaches like in Australia, where you um, uh, use this trummel to separate the plastic rubbish from, from the beach. But this trummel is a bit of uh, mod modified and this Trommel you see here in this photo is actually a prototype um, in testing um, to, uh, it is modified, uh, the mesh of this trommel is modified to be able to um, separate the small nodules from the, from the sand. So it was very useful and effective as well. So this is the end of my slides, but I do have another quiz for everyone. So um, let me share the screen and uh, give, just give me one minute. Right, so if you can scan this QR code. Oh yeah, I let me give you the link as well. Chat box. For anyone who's not um, comfortable with using the smartphone for this, um, this uh, quiz. Right. So uh, please scan this QR code and uh, I encourage everyone to try and join this quiz. It's, uh, it's actually quite fun, actually more fun than the previous one. So I just start a countdown of 30 seconds for everyone to join in, in the interest of time. So I see there's about 10 people in the quiz. So I hope more, more of you guys can 
join this quiz. Right, more people joining. All right, I'll be moving on. So um, if you uh, are not able to um, uh, scan it, uh, please use the link that I've provided in the chat, yeah? So the first question, uh, what are the different um, OSPO response strategies that you know, you've learned today? So um, I'm sure on your phone or on your screen, you can see a few blanks. So just type in any OSPO response strategy that you remember that we've discussed in, in this session today. Just any that comes to your mind, just type in any amount that you want. If you can remember just one, just type in one and sum it. Great, the first one, containment and recovery. Any more? I'll give it about um, 30 seconds as well for everyone to um, you know, input your ideas. Institute burning, natural, yeah, dispersants. Institute burning, oil institute burning, observation, monitoring, that's good. Shoreline cleanup, yeah. Booming, yeah, burning. Yeah, it's very good. Any more ideas? All right, ISB, yeah. Monitoring evaluation, yeah. All right, that's very good. So yeah, that's about covers um, most of what I what we what we've discussed. So Pui Hang went through a, a, a very good presentation on uh, uh, monitoring and observation, um, and uh, I've talked about institute burning, dispersion, uh, containment and recovery, shoreline cleanup. So uh, very good that you guys remember most of it. So now it's a quiz where um, different. Uh, players will be you know, competing. So please put in your name. You'll get a cute character assigned to you and uh, we'll start the quiz. So I'll give it uh, about... So if you answer faster, um, you can uh, get higher points. So, which is not true of using this person. So there's a few questions. So choose carefully. It's not true of using this person. Thumbs up. Let's see who got. Most people use uh, can use in shallow water near sensitive resources. Yes, because the question is not true of using this person, so um, you cannot use it in shallow water near sensitive resources. So, yep. So leaderboard. Who's leading? Simon. Congratulations, Simon. You got the the fastest. Very good. Moving on to the next question. What are the advantages of using institute burning? So is it less amount of waste generated, uh, capable of removing oil mixture with debris, or you can operate in rough weather conditions, or is it all of the above? Let's see. Yeah, so all of the above is not the correct answer because the third one, um, in situ burning, you cannot operate in rough weather and conditions. So the first two answers, whoever answered the first two is correct. Let's see who is leading now. Ah, okay, Simon is still the leading person. Very good. Question three. So for offshore booming, U formation, how many vessels are required? I hope you remember this. Um, there's a few type of booming. So for U formation booming, how many vessels do you think is required? So just take a wild guess if you can remember. All right, two vessels and three vessels, equal number of answers. So the correct answer is three vessels, two vessels for containment and one vessel for recovery. So who is leading? Uh, 
Oh, Simon is still leading, no? but um, Henderson is catching up real quick, very close competition now. And uh, Mr. Danger is not far behind as well. The last question. Remember, answer fast to get more points. So what is the most suitable type of oil for mechanical skimmers? So the answer are, the options are light viscosity, light medium or medium to heavy viscosity oil. So which do you think is the most suitable for mechanical type skimmers? Yes, most people got the right answer. So that is very good. So let's see who's the winner for this quiz. Whoa. Ah, Henderson overtook Simon. So congratulations, Henderson. You're the winner. So yeah, that brings to the end of my PowerPoint slides. To be, um, yes, so let me just go back to my slide. Yep. Thanks, thanks, uh, Nobel. Yeah. Uh, can I get uh, Pui Hang to on her video uh, for the quick plenary uh, that we will have? Okay, so we have Pui Hang. Uh, okay, so quick questions. Um, oh, before, before that, um, again, reminder to our participants to answer the attendance form. Uh, so again, the link is shared by a chat box. So please do answer that and then tell us whether you require a certificate. Okay, so quick question. So we have a couple of minutes to finish or to answer some of the questions. So let me start, uh, ask this question to Novell first. So this question is about in situ burning. Uh, with regards to in situ burning, would you recommend in situ burning to be used in an area where you have sensitive marine environment or you have a sensitive ecosystem? Yes, yeah, so um, since we are burning the oil, it creates a lot of environmental um, pollution. So we, so both in situ burning and dispersant application, we have to be very mindful about the sensitive uh, resources in the vicinity. So it depends on the sensitive resource. So, but um, typically I would say um, it might not be recommended, but obviously you will need to go through uh, proper assessment uh, using um, a SEMA, um, MIBA. So it, you have to do a proper assessment, but typically in a nutshell, yes, uh, institute burning and dispersion, they're not, recommended for um, use near sensitive resources. Yeah. Okay, so again, a proper assessment is needed before you can use uh, in situ burning. Is that correct, Nobel? Yes. Yeah, correct. All right, good. Thanks uh, for uh, Puihan. Um, given you have given us a number of surveillance options, so any specific surveillance options that you could recommend using it at the Arafura and Timor Seas? Or would there be such recommendation? Uh, yes. Um, so I think we shared a few, I mean, quite a few options. Um, I think there's always um, advantages and disadvantages to the various type of surveillance tools. So I think the very common one that I think we'll use will be the aerial platforms. So to do the aerial surveillance. So I think that can be done using as, as the plane is the helicopters or the fixed wings aircraft because it gives you a fast and wide coverage of the spill area. But for sure, if you want to do a close-up uh, observations uh, on shore, I would say the observers and the nautical surveys will be able to give you a quite a good close-up uh, look on the oil. So I think it will depend on the, I would say the applications in terms of what at the stage you are in. Mm -hmm. So I think in the beginning, definitely you want to go for the fast and uh, what coverage so that you know what's the extent of the oil, you want to know what to do next. So definitely I think area platform is something that you want to consider. For sure, I think satellite, because you have lesser restrictions, um, you can actually define the area of, uh, I would say that search box or the area that you want to look into. However, I think the disadvantage will be, I think the time. So I think for the first image being obtained by the satellites, it will depend on various uh, factors. So I think in time critical wise, I think, area platforms or area surveillance will be your recommended choice. 
So basically, Pia, what you're saying is we start with aerial surveillance, but as we want to get more clarity on the on the image, then we could use other platforms as well. Yes, that's right. All right, good. Uh, again, another question to Nobel. This one again for in situ burning. Uh, from your experience or personal opinion, uh, is there a weather condition that is acceptable or not acceptable in the uh, in situ burning population? Yeah, so um, I think in, 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 in one of my slides, I've gone through um, actually in situ burning actually need a very calm sea and good weather. Um, because we are containing the, the oil with the boom, so basically the type of sea uh, calmness that we require will be uh, similar to at sea containment and recovery. So it's about wave height of about less than one meter and current of about one knot. If it is more than that, we might have current, um, current failure or like a splash over failure, which we might lose control of the institute burning. And uh, we, we need to think about the wind speed as well. If the wind speed is too strong, uh, it might, we, the burn might not be able to sustain. And um, if it is too strong, uh, you, you might um, lose control of the burning again, um, because, uh, you might get like uh, higher wave heights where you will be have a splash over where you lose control of the fire and um, yeah, you will lead to undesirable effects. Yeah. So if it's a choppy weather, choppy current, you wouldn't recommend in situ burning? No. Nope. Right. Okay, so I think we have one more, uh, we have time for one more question and I will pass this on to Puihang. Uh, and I think you have done some modeling before as part of your uh, response, Pihan, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So question is this, uh, there are information on the current, uh, direction and speed of the current is often difficult to obtain. So do you have any tips or good options for obtaining this kind of data? Oh, of course. So I think, um... Uh, so that in there are free, I think, weather data available, available for the public domain. I think same with OSRL. I think we also utilize uh, them as it's impossible to obtain or to purchase data for every country as we support our members worldwide. So I think some of the, I think, uh, online available source will be the Copernicus, uh, Met Oceans Marine Service. So I think we need to just to register uh, the uh, thing, a username and you can able to download the data or even the boy weather. So I think you will be able to access to certain days of, uh, I think the wind and the current data. Uh, as well as I think where one popular will be under the NOAA, which is the, uh, I mean, the, in the States, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's um, Department. They actually is very, have a very good and I would say comprehensive websites to show you different kind of even modeling tools, uh, weather data, part B pass or the forecast that you're able to use. So I think something that for you to able to, uh, to visit and have a look. However, all said that the downloaded data need to be further processed so that it will fit into your oil spill modeling uh, software that we'll be using. So I think you're able to download, but I think importantly that you're able to fit into the software you have uh, to process it further. When you say feed, that means it should be compatible to the modeling software. Yes, correct. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, what we could do also is we can write down all of those websites that you have mentioned, we have, and then we can release it as part of our online article. Would that be okay? Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Right. So thank you, Puihang and Nobel. Uh, I think we have uh, reached uh, the end of our um, of our uh, um, webinar. Um, again, thank you so much, everyone, for uh, participating in this uh, webinar. So for those who haven't uh, completed the attendance and feedback link yet, please do complete that and then indicate whether uh, whether you need a certificate or not. We would really appreciate if you could complete the set attendance list. So we will be seeing you again. Uh, we have two more webinars for this year. Uh, these are scheduled in quarter three and quarter four of 2022 respectively. So please do sign up for our upcoming webinar. So the link is shown in your screens. Uh, and also follow us in Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. Uh, same thing, 
for on behalf of ATSI, uh, we do thank you for your participation and thank you for all your uh, questions. So don't worry if we didn't um, mention your question today, uh, but rest assured we will answer your questions uh, via online article that we will be releasing uh, sometime soon. So again, thank you everyone.